This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to Gambia, where an ongoing Public Truth and Reconciliation Commission is investigating the atrocities of former President Yahya Jame, who ruled the West African country of two million people for 22 years before his regime ended in 2017. During the hearings, members of Jame's death squad have admitted to killing migrants, journalists and civilians during the president's reign. Survivors of the regime have also testified during the hearings, which have been live-streamed across the country. The investigation is part of an ongoing process to reckon with the horrors committed during Jame's rule, including killing and disappearing hundreds of people, torture, unjustified jailings and sexual violence against women and girls. But the perpetrators of this violence have never been brought to justice, including Jame himself, who fled to Equatorial Guinea in 2017 after losing the 2016 presidential election. He refused to cede power for weeks before leaders in the region helped arrange his exile. Among those demanding Jame be tried in criminal court for his crimes is a Gambian beauty queen who says the president raped her when she was 18. Fatu Jallo, known as Tufa, has become a leading voice against the former president. In this Human Rights Watch video, she tells her story. I can't wait to face Yaya Jame. I was 18 years old when he raped me in 2015. I've spent the last four years wanting to erase, to hide that it didn't happen. Like, life is all good. It happened. He is no longer the president. My family is fine. Life goes on. That's pretty easy, right? I wish that is what it was. The pageant is a competition of women empowerment. So the message in behind it was to empower women, to give them a platform to compete and talk about issues that affect their communities, and also have a scholarship for girls so they can go and study abroad and come back to the country and contribute. And the winner is to A. Jalo from Gambia College. Wow! I was so proud of myself. I am a crowned queen, right? And I'm going to study abroad. My first time meeting the ex-president was in 2014. Towards the end of the year after the pageant, we were invited to the state house. Jame used state channels to pressure women to visit him and work for him. He abused many of them. He began reaching out to Tufe, claiming an interest in her community service project. One day, he asked that he wanted to marry me. But I told him, I, I'm not planning to. I don't want to get married. I want to go and study. That's the reason why I got into this pageant. A few weeks later, Jame invited Tufe back to the state house. In his eyes, all I saw was just a sense of anger at the fact that I would have the audacity somehow to say no to him. The president, he did what he wanted to do. And I was screaming, and at some point, I couldn't hear my scream anymore. And he told me, no one is going to hear me anyways. Well, I'm going to say this story again, and I'm going to own this story. Tufe has decided to tell her story to the Gambian Truth Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. The commission can recommend that Jame be prosecuted. My justice, most importantly, includes a whole system change so that we can prosecute these men, have our day in court. Nobody discusses rape. And yes, I am scared. I'm scared, but I want the next person after me to be a little less scared than me. That's Fatu Jalo, known as Tufa.
Two other women have also come forward to accuse the former president of Gambia of rape and sexual assault. Human Rights Watch says Yahya Jame, quote, handpicked women and girls to rape or sexually assault while president requiring so-called protocol girls to be on call for sex. He denies the claims. Well, Tufe joins us now in our New York studio, along with attorney Reed Brody of Human Rights Watch, who's currently leading the prosecution of the former Gambian dictator, Yahya Jame. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Tufe, your bravery is, um, uh, you know, is unbelievable, what you went through. Uh, we didn't want you to have to describe this again, your assault, but this is only a part of the story. You then had to escape from Gambia. Explain what happened next. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, leaving the country was very prompt. It happened uh, a week after the incident, and um, because I received a call again from a protocol officer to go back to some event, and I realized that it's, it's not a life I would want to leave, to be just called and picked up by the president at any time that he wanted. I remember waking up in the morning and deciding to go to the market. I put on the niqab, which is the Muslim attire, that only my face or eyes would sew. And I put the passport just right by my waist, and I walked to the market to do grocery shopping. And when I realized that whoever is following me at this point is convinced that I'm actually buying groceries, I jumped into a cab that was going to the capital, where you had to cross a border to get to the other side of the border, into Senegal. I got onto a boat, a fishing boat, because I couldn't take the ferry. I crossed with the boat, and then um, right at the border, I realized I couldn't take the former route, because I had to sew paperwork. I joined in a big truck that carried livestock, like cows and goats, and I squeezed in between two guys in the front seat of the truck. And that's how I found myself in Senegal. And can you talk about, we mentioned this briefly, uh, and you've just said again that you fled uh, uh, in part, obviously, because you were called again by a protocol officer uh, to go back. Who were these protocol girls? Why are they called protocol girls? And the fact that after you came uh, out with your own story, the government actually asked for other people to come and testify as well about their experiences. Right. So can you talk about whether you met these other girls, girls who were right. who were also assaulted by uh, right. the former president, and the women who've come forward after you've spoken out? Right. Um, the protocol girls their role was very nuanced and very unclear to the rest of the population, but there were girls that worked at the state house to do paperwork or have guests. The state house is where he lives? Or it's lived? where he lives. That is the, house, the, the state house. office and the presidential palace. Mm -hmm. And that's where he raped you? That's, that's where the incident happened, yeah. And uh, the protocol girls did work there, and uh, one of them in particular, called Jimbi Jamme, was the one who kept in contact with me and invited me to these events and also um, tried to get as close to me as she can. Um, the rest of the other girls, I wasn't very um, well known to them, or I didn't know them because we didn't interact a lot. Um, some of the other girls that I've met, like as we can see in the report, there are two other women that accuse him, but they have decided to remain anonymous. I have met one of them, and I've met other women in private, but again, within the culture that we live in, rape is not something you want to own publicly. What gave you the courage to? say your name? Because it's my story. Because it's my truth. And nobody can tell it better than I can. And it's time for someone to own it. It's time for someone to start the conversation. I did not want to be part of the people that would protect my perpetrator, who I believe have done it to so many other people. Knowing the consequences of it, I wanted to say my name, because there are faces and actual human beings behind these stories. You charge the former dictator with rape? I charged him with rape. And the other two women whom you mentioned, are they still uh, in uh, the Gambia? Um, when it's not, when it is, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, this is all part of the um, being raised in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I wanted to turn to Sergeant Omar Chalo, a member of the junglers, uh, Yahya Jame's elite hit squad. During Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation, Reparations Commission, Jallo testified on the killing of 56 West African migrants in 2005. When we arrive at the ground, yes. 
Solo said these people are mercenaries. The order from the head of state, the former president, Yaya Jame, is to they are all to be, they are all to be executed. That's Sergeant Omar Jallo, no relation to Tufa. Um, Re Brody, I wanted to bring you into this conversation right now. Um, put this story. I mean, Tufa is astounding in her bravery um, and the wherewithal to escape the country um, and then to speak out. And you're planning to return? Planning to return and next month to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Put Gambia uh, in a geopolitical context, where it is, Reid, and the significance of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, what it took to get to this point. Well, uh, Yaya Jame was the ruler of Gambia for 22 years. Gambia is a tiny country almost totally surrounded by Senegal, with the exception of its Atlantic, 60-mile uh, Atlantic front. Um, Yaya Jame lost an election. He first uh, accepted the results, then refused to accept them. Um, and he only left the country after Gambians actually rose up in a Gambia has decided movement. And other West African countries who were fed up with Yaya Jami, fed up with his interference with rebels in Senegal, landmines in Senegal, um, drug trafficking, corruption, um, forced him uh, to step down. Uh, two years ago. And then uh, the government decided to establish this landmark Truth Commission, which is it's like a soap opera. I mean, people are coming, as you saw, on live TV. I, I mean, you get into a taxi, you go to a home, and people are watching these people testify. Uh, they're going to have a special hearing on, on sexual violence uh, next month, where, where, where TUFA will testify. As you mentioned in our report, we showed that Jame had an entire system of bringing women um, to his office to visit him. Uh, he would he would see women in crowds and tell his assistants to bring them to, and then he he, he sexually abused them. But we're also hearing witness after witness, Jame's own hitmen confessing to having participated uh, on Jame's orders in the killing of uh, distinguished journalist and editor Data Hydera, in the killing of two Gambian American citizens who were ordered to be and who were chopped to pieces. Um, uh, let's go to a bit more of the testimony, to Staff Sergeant Amadou Badji, another member of the so-called junglers, which was the name for Yaya Jame's elite hit squad during Gambia's Truth Commission. He testified on the killing of two Gambian Americans. Yaya Jame said, let's kill these people and cut off and, and, and cut their uh, flesh into pieces. Cut them up into cut pieces. Cut them up into pieces. Like they would do meat. Again, Definitely. this is broadcasting live throughout Gambia. That's right. It's, and and people are watching this. People are uh, this is the topic of conversation in, in the Gambia. And also in Ghana. Um, interestingly, the 56 migrants who uh, were assassinated, these were 56 West African migrants who were trying to get to Europe. Um, their canoe was beached in the Gambia. They were all arrested, and 55 of them were killed. One of them escaped to tell the tale. And because of him, we're, we are able to, to, to see that the junglers killed not just Gambians, but 44 people from Ghana. Nine people from Nigeria, Togo, Ivory Coast, Senegal. So J Jame is accused not just of murdering Gambian citizens, not just of raping Gambian citizens, but also murdering the citizens of five other West African and where countries. Is he? So now Jame is in Equatorial Guinea, um, which, as as you know, Amy, um, is one of the long-standing dictatorships in Africa. Um, as part of the deal to finally get his troops were coming in, as the Gambian people were surrounding and trying to get him out, um, he fled to Equatorial Guinea, which has ruled, been ruled for over 40 years by Teodoro Obiang, um, and uh, who has vowed to protect Yaya Jame. So we're hoping that the testimony of people like Tufa, the testimonies at the Truth Commission, the testimonies of the victims are going to build a political will um, so that all of Africa, all of West Africa comes together to request that Yaya Jami be delivered to justice. And Tufa, you are uh, going to testify uh, next month uh, against Jami as part of the, the Truth Commission. Talk about what you're going to say. Um, 
First of all, I want to be at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because I want the issue of sexual assault to be part of what we write as a history, what we recount as a history. Um, I'm going to talk about my story and the stories of other women and the two women that are also in the report to put a face to the, 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 the atrocities that have been committed on Gambian women, you know? Sometimes it is often forgotten how the women populace have really suffered under Yajame, how we were used as pawns and tools politically and in the bedroom and in the state house, like the protocol girls themselves. Sometimes I see them as victims because they were used as a machine for Yajame. We were used to vote for him. We were not given uh, the opportunity to actually take important roles in, in the society. So I, I wish to be there to express these sentiments and to tell my story the way it is, to make it a national conversation. I want to thank you so much for both being with us. We're going to do part two of this conversation, and we're going to post it online at democracynow.org. Tufa Jallo is a Gambian feminist and anti-rape activist returning to Gambia to tell her story. She's taken refuge in Toronto, Canada. Reed Brody, known as the Dictator Hunter, is a counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. He is currently leading the prosecution of the ex-president, Yaya Chame. That does it for our broadcast. Tomorrow's show, produced by Mike Burke, Dina Geister, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Libby Rainey, Sam Alcock, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. Thanks so much for joining us.